my name is Mike Scott. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a cryptographer. And uh, I remember Bill's, remember this morning, Bill's first slide had that seven layer thing. Uh, I'm one of the guys down in the basement there. I think he's down in the crypto lab. Uh, uh, most of the activity seems to happen in that model from the top down. Mm -hmm. People have the vision, people have the idea, and then they realize security is an important part of it. And then they hope that the cryptography, if you like, is put from the bottom and uh, do the job as, as necessary. Right? Me, I, I, I say I, I am a cryptographer, I've been an academic cryptographer for many years, but I'm kind of swimming in the other direction. I'm trying to swim up, the, if you like, through the layers. And I, I must say, I'm kind of swimming against the tide because most of the stuff comes down, the requirements come down, all the rest of it. Cryptographers are trying to push upwards in the kitty. We can do this, we can do that, what do you think you're selling? But uh, it's kind of harder to, to, to swim up there because there's, there's, uh, there's not as much exciting work going like you have your completely commercial. So, uh, as I say, as I got to those higher le levels, I, I felt a deep sense of vertigo, right? Because suddenly um, people are talking a language I don't understand anymore. They're talking about cryptography in a way that I don't recognize anymore. They're making assumptions about the cryptography, which I know that maybe aren't true at all, right? So you get into this worrying place where people say, ah, crypto, they're doing crypto and providing that same magic, but maybe it won't. Let me, let me give an example of uh, why this situation is quite complicated. <laughs> right. Let's think of three activities that we might be able to improve uh, using digital uh, technology. Let's look at exams, voting, and commerce, right? And let's stick E in front of all of them. So let's consider E exams, E voting, E commerce. Right, so let's start with E exams. Why do we want it? Well, examinations, big state examinations take place in big halls where lots of students sit down and in probably the single handwriting exercise of their life, they answer exam papers. They do it handwriting, right? The whole thing is pen and paper. It's all completely manual. It involves incredible expense. There's obviously security involved because you don't want students cheating, right? So where is the e-exam technology? Right, it's not there. And you only have to think about it for a few minutes to realize that's not going to work, right? That, that's mad. That, that's actually slightly crazy, right? There's not many startups suggesting e-exam technology if you look out there. And I think it doesn't take you long to realize the reason why. Let's take a second example, e-voting, right? There's another example of a, a, a pencil and paper activity that surely could be improved using digital technology. Well, in my country, Ireland, they, they attempted to introduce such technology about 10 years ago. They, they got these ghastly machines, and they, they were going to use them in elections. Uh, myself and some other academics got our hands on them, and we were able to demonstrate that they were utterly insecure, and we were able to get that stopped just in time. E-voting is actually a very bad idea, and don't let anyone try and tell you any different, right? It's because it's... Uh, because the, the, the reason why, it's, it's interesting to actually look at the reason why. It's all to do with trust at the end of the day, right? We, we, we gotta trust the process, right? Otherwise, it, the process becomes useless. And uh, people often snigger at, at pencil and paper uh, methods of doing things, but I'll tell you something about pencil and paper, right? That paper, I don't care where it came from, it could be made in Russia, I trust it, right? To act as a piece of paper. This pen may have been made in China, uh, Right? But I trust it. It's just a bloody pen. Right? Now, do I have the same trust relationship with my, my mobile phone? Oh, no, I don't. This phone has entirely got its own agenda. This is a, 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 almost an intelligent entity in its own right. Do I trust it? No, I don't. And you'd be, you'd be crazy if you did, because the amount of things you have to trust in order to trust that device, it's really startling. You have to trust maybe Microsoft, you have to trust Google, you have to trust Facebook. You have to trust whoever, whatever apps you're using. You have to trust those FPGAs from China that are in there somewhere doing something. So you've, you've, there's a massive uh, uh, issue there around trust. And the, the way voting works, manual voting works, is we distribute the trust. And that, that's really the answer to the trust problem. You distribute it. If you go into a count center during an election, you'll see lots of civil servants with the day off uh, 
for, for the work, and they're all tallying papers manually into piles and heaps. And you can go in and look at them doing it. There's the hundreds of people involved. The whole thing is distributed. The idea of somebody fixing it is, is, is really quite ridiculous, right? And that, 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 that's really the, uh, what we would like to mimic uh, electronically. If we're going to try and to introduce electronic voting, we need some trusted way of distributing the process so the trust doesn't lie in just one particular place. Otherwise, that trust will almost certainly be betrayed. Right? So, e-voting, nah, not quite ready for, uh, for, 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 for prime time yet. What about e-commerce? Well, e-commerce. E-commerce works. Right? Used to be done, pencil and paper. Right? But we... Digital technology has completely replaced it, successfully replaced it, right? So that's interesting, isn't it? We've gone through the spectrum from being completely laughably impossible to really not ready for prime time yet. It's probably far too soon, maybe someday in the future, e-voting, to the completely practical e-commerce, which we use every day to buy things. It works in the real world, in other words. It works in the real world, right? So. How do we get that stack to work? So the highfalutin ideas down here and the cryptography down here all gel together perfectly so that we can then roll it out into the real world, right? A very good example of that happening outside e-commerce is actually Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a great example of some fintech dreamers having this idea of this decentralized banking system. You had a cryptographer coming up from the bottom showing what could be done with cryptography and perfect fit. Right. And Bitcoin, whatever you can snigger at it and all the rest of it, it's out there, it's worth something, it's valuable. Right? So, so Bitcoin does actually work. In other cases, unfortunately, and that's really the topic of my talk, is that we're, we're, that, that's not happening. That connection, it, we're, people are talking different languages, we're missing each other, assumptions are made about the cryptography that are wrong, really good cryptographic ideas aren't being used. And, and the cryptographers are down here saying, hey, look at this, we can do this. And people up there say, no, no, we don't want that, we want this, surely you can do that. And, and maybe we can't do that. So that's the problem that I, I'm hoping to address. Right, so that's, uh, that's my basic point. There's a yawning gap between academic cryptography and industry. The need for cybersecurity, of course, has never been clearer, right? So the need is definitely out there. And we all know that when it, if the thing we're trying to digitize uh, has a security issue, then at the, uh, somewhere we're going to have to involve cryptography, right? So, uh, and, and cryptography is, has, has impressed in the past because it can do quite magical things. Public key cryptography is really quite magical. Back in the 1960s, the very concept wasn't heard of. The idea you could have a public key and a separate private key. Hadn't occurred to anyone. No one knew it was doable. In the 1970s, some academics, in fact, in the, in the secret world, the idea had already been discovered a few years beforehand. But prior to the 1970s, nobody knew how to do public key cryptography. Right, uh, zero knowledge proof, it's amazing, it's like magic. I can prove possession of a certain piece of information, I can prove to you that I have it while revealing nothing about it, right? It's like a magic trick, it's like a conjurer. And people can get a bit bedazzled by that kind of cryptography, that kind of trickery. They kind of overestimate what cryptographers can do, you know, because they can do all these magic tricks. Maybe they can solve all our problems, but maybe they can't. Cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, the very concept is a little bit magical, isn't it? You've got this thing floating up there, no physical uh, tangibility to it, yet of real value, right? How did cryptography literally magic the currency out of fresh air? I mean, you've got to be impressed by that. So cryptography can do to good stuff, but we need more magic. Now, uh, briefly, history, modern cryptography kicked off uh, after World War II. Governments have this interest, sometimes healthy, sometimes less so. Uh, uh, and cryptography has often been a pretty obscure uh, academic pursuit. Uh, I'll hurry through this a little bit. Uh, right, and but the problem that I'm addressing, and I'm going to address it in a kind of constructive way, because at the end I'm going to, I'm going to give you something, I'm going to provide something. It's not a full solution to the problem, but it, hopefully it, it'll help us towards a solution. One problem with cryptography is it's, it's an unavoidably mathematical. Right, and if you've done what I've done, sit in the boardroom, talking to a CEO of a company, trying to explain your technology, the minute you get malzy with them, you've lost them. You start talking about elliptic curves and drawing them on boards, and they go, okay, whatever, you know. 
you lose them. It was, back in the day when it was just integer factorization, you could actually relate to them. But, but now cryptography has got a little bit too complicated to explain in, in a kind of primary school uh, maths uh, kind of dialogue, right? So there's a communications problem right there. A lot of people just hate maths, right? Understand, well, not understandably, but they do. I, I have to just accept that, right? Uh, the other thing about cryptography is it's very hard for the poor consumer of it to know what's real and what's not. There is actually a lot of snake oil out there. There's a lot of crypto hucksters out there, right? So how do you differentiate the good stuff, the real stuff, from the, the dodgy stuff, right? The, the clever guy is just trying to sell you something and the person who has something of real value, right? Sometimes it's hard to distinguish, right? The cryptography we use today is basically public key cryptography, uh, also known as PKI. PKI was invented back in the 1970s, right? And when people talk about cryptography today, if you look at what they're actually using, you trace down, you'll almost certainly find it at the bottom. When you get to the bottom of that seven layer stack, they're using good old public key cryptography. Now, that was discovered in the 1970s. 1970s was 50 years ago. I mean, that's ancient history. I mean, how much technology do we use that's that old in other spheres of life? How many of you have got Ford Anglias parked out in the car park there? You know, it, it is quite an astonishing thing that cryptography, which is needed for all this modernization, is that we're still using such old stuff. And it's not that cryptographers have been asleep for 50 years, you know? We haven't, right? Sometimes it worked very well, because in the 1970s, along came public key cryptography, as I described, along came the internet, a match made in heaven, because it's not clearly understood that without public key cryptography, there would be no e-commerce. None. E-commerce simply doesn't work without public key cryptography. So cometh the hour, cometh the man, right? Cometh the, the internet, cometh public key cryptography, boom, e-commerce, bang. The whole thing went, went great after that. So we got, certainly got off to a good start. Right, thing is after that, things got stuck, right? We really haven't moved on. There's no, the cybersecurity challenges are more subtle, more complex, there's more of them. The 1970 tools are beginning to look more like lump hammers while we need something more subtle, like a Swiss army knife uh, type of solution, right? So what went wrong? Have, have, is it our cryptographers to blame? Have we simply sat in our hands for 50 years? 50 years ago, we said, there's public key cryptography. Grand, right, I can I go on sabbatical now for 50 years. No, that didn't happen. Cryptography is an incredibly active research area, incredibly exciting area, and the cryptographers out tray is stacked high with all kinds of new ideas which simply aren't being taken up in the appropriate way. What have we got for you? We got in our shop window here, we got homomorphic encryption, we got password authenticated key exchange, we got identity based encryption, we got attribute based encryption, we got secret sharing, we got multi party computation, we got zero knowledge proof, we got lots of stuff, right? And everyone comes and looks and says, I'll take the PKI, you know, thanks very much, but I think I know about this one, right? And they ignore all this good stuff, right? Because they don't got a really clear understanding of what it can do. Right? Re relatively little take up. People will talk about it. People will mention it in passing. You know, they'll say, oh, we'll solve that problem with homomorphic encryption. You know, uh, do you really know what homomorphic encryption is? Do you really know what it can do? Do you really know its limitations? Right? Mm. Right, so academics, to a large extent, have, have gone back into their own shell, right? We, we, Cryptographer, like when I was a full-time cryptographer, we went to crypto conferences, we talked crypto to each other, we just did crypto stuff. We, we, cryptographers would literally invent imaginary scenarios, completely unreal world scenarios, and find solutions for them. You know, they'd set a little academic exercise and then they'd academically solve it. Utterly irrelevant to the real world, right? But in a sense, that's because the real world has been ignoring us. So we have started ignoring the real world and we've floated off and done all kinds of silly things, you know, and... Uh, and that's a pity, right? So, but cryptographers, there are a lot of cryptographers who are very aware of the problem and we're doing our best to, to, to come up with a solution. The general public, thanks primarily to Bitcoin, has a new awareness of the potential of crypto. This is the crypto's latest magic trick that has projected the word cryptography into people's heads. And that's a great starting point for us to move on from, right? Recently, when I was in Dublin, I saw an advert for a cryptocurrency on the side of a bus. You really know you've made it when you're on the side of a bus. And I know the people in this country certainly are very impressed by things that they read on the sides of buses. Right? And, uh, yeah, so that's a, bit of a, that's a bit of a big breakthrough, 
right, to, 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 to have got that level of exposure. Right? Now, cryptographers and, uh, have organized a series of what are called real-world crypto conferences. And this is our attempt from the bottom, of, bottom up to try and cross the gap, right? To say, okay, we're not going to sit amongst ourselves talking nonsense. We want to talk to you guys in the real world. Come to us. We'll talk to you. We'll try and get that dialogue going. We'll see what your needs are. We'll tell you what we've got. We'll sit down patiently with you and explain exactly what we've got does for you. And you, you explain to us your needs, and we'll say, mm, maybe. And, and we can just have that dialogue and have it in a proper, civilized way without anyone looking down on anyone else. Right? So these conferences take place every year. They, both sides of the Atlantic, they alternate. I forgot where it's happening this year. But if you just Google for RWC, uh, Real World Crypto Conferences, you'll find out where it is. Strongly recommend it if you're working on anything blockchain related that needs cryptography. Right? This is where you can go and talk to the real deal guys. Right? Now, how do we... Here, here's, my, here's our attempt to help. Right? Uh, as I say, I left uh, academic cryptography uh, about uh, 10 years ago. I, I swam uphill into the commercial world. I, I took some of the ideas of cryptography with me, some of my own research with me. I'm in a company called Miracle, and we're trying to exploit this, these newer ideas in cryptography to produce new products, right? But that's not primarily what I'm here to talk about today. I'm talking, of, I want to talk about another contribution that we, that we want to make. And that is, is to reduce the friction, to make it easier for people to deploy cryptography, right? And one way in which we can communicate usefully upwards is via software, uh, hardware products, is via cryptographic libraries. We can provide the libraries and the code so that to the next layer up, right? In a very comfortable, easy to use way, right? So without making it all techy and mathematicy, a real nice smooth interface to the layers above us. To minimize the friction, so if you want cryptography, we can provide it almost certainly in exactly the form that you want it to do whatever it is that you want. Right? Now, crypt, uh, cryptographic libraries are best written by cryptographers, believe it or not. It's not a software engineering job. Right, because their crypto code has some unexpected constraints that a regular software engineer may well not be aware of. Right? Simply implementing from a spec isn't good enough. Simple mistakes and you completely undermine the security, you completely undermine the encryption, and you're, you're actually introducing a weakness into the system rather than providing cryptographic strength. Now, academics, unfortunately, they do produce a lot of software, but they produce it to impress one another. They're, they're working sideways. You know, look what I can do, look what I can do. They're not really focused upwards to, to, to uh, industrial consumers. Right? And that's a bit of a problem. You've all heard of publish or perish, right? Well, if you come up with a new library, a new implementation, that's publishable. Yeah, we accept that as a publishable activity, but only if it's faster. You've got to show you've got a slightly faster algorithm, a slightly faster implementation. So everything concentrates around speed, right? So that gets you your publication, that gets you your Google Scholar take, that gets you up the, up the greasy academic ladder or whatever. Right? Other things don't matter. Your code may be bloated, may be poorly supported, may not be portable. That doesn't matter a damn. It may be a nightmare to maintain, but that's not my problem. Right? I got my publication. I'm gone now. Right? So uh, that, that's, the, uh, that's the problem with a lot of the stuff that currently we get from academia. So there's some serious friction involved when some poor devil of a software engineer is tasked with putting some crypto into the boss's shiny new Internet of Things device. Right, so what can we do to help? Right, well, first of all, we can identify the sources of the friction. Right, first of all, let's provide a library which requires no third-party add-on. So you don't, as if you know, here's my library. Oh, by the way, you'll need this library as well. Then you'll need this one. They all have different licensing terms, and it all gets blah, blah, blah. Let's provide something that's completely self-contained. Right? So you don't have to look any further. Make it open source, obviously. In cryptography, open source is more important even than in other disciplines because you like other people to be able to look at your code and see that it's secure. They're not going to trust a closed source crypto product. No, you'd be mad to do that. Right? So write it in a high level language, no assembly language code. If it's 5% slower than it could be, that's not the end of the world. In real world, safety and security trump speed. Right, and of course that's right. At the end of the day, what you want is a security. 5% faster on a particular device is really neither here nor there. In the academic world, 
that's more what the game is about. But in the real world, that doesn't really count, right? Optimize for space rather than time, right? Because sometimes you're working in a very constrained device. And if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. You know, that's your game over. You know, if it's a bit slower, it's a bit slower. You can still live with that. But if it doesn't fit, you're dead, right? And like, here's an idea. Provide it in the consumer's favorite language, right? What is, so you have to need to figure out what is the consumer's favorite language? Because that's a source of friction. If I'm a Java guy, I want the code provided in Java. If I'm a C++ guy, I don't like to program. I hate Java. And these guys, I mean, some people love certain languages, but they also actively hate others, you know? So you wanted to provide it in the language that they feel most comfortable with, right? So let's introduce our solution. This is our uh, proposed, this is our library. If I click on that, it might come up. We didn't try this before. Oh yeah, there it is, right? So we're just launching this actually today. This is uh, what we call the Miracle Core Cryptographic Library. And you can see the question about which is your favorite language. Uh, well, actually, let's provide it in all of them, right? So this, this cryptographic library is available in, uh, I think, probably everyone's favorite language. C, C++, Go, Java, JavaScript, Python, Rust, Swift. It's also available in C Sharp through code translators. Uh, WASM, uh, WebAssembly, very important these days. Yeah, you can get it uh, in that form easy enough. And look at the top, Arduino. Uh, people talk about Internet of Things. This is an Internet of Things processor. This has a, an ARM M0, Cortex M0 uh, processor on 32-bit, clocked at 48 megahertz. This is, is a lower powered processor than my Fitbit. My Fitbit has a Cortex M4. Its battery life is something like four days. This thing, you put a battery on, it'll last for two weeks, three weeks. Bigger battery, it'll last for months. Right, this thing has Wi-Fi on it. This is your classic uh, IoT uh, node, right? It, it has, it's fully wireless. It, it can have its own IP address. It, can, it supports elliptic curve cryptography, actually, in hardware. It has its own random number generator for generating keys, right? It's called an MK1000. It costs $25 uh, to buy. Right, so you want your crypto to fit on that. And now, if it'll fit on that, it'll fit in anything, right? Because this is the lowest end of the market. This is below this, right? Never mind your mobile phones and all the rest of it way up there, right? This is the lowest of the low. Uh, uh, these libraries, this, uh, Arduino only supports C++, not a problem. We have C++ support. So the C++ version can work on this, and we can implement the most elaborate pairing-based elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, it takes up maybe 20% of the, the, the ROM resources on that, and uh, maybe uh, maybe uh, 8K of RAM. This has 32K of RAM. So it's, a, it's an easy fit. If, you want, if you've got a device like this connected to your IoT, whatever it is, and you want to secure it, no problem. We, we, it'll all fit on that. And it'll fit on that, it'll fit on anything. Right, so, oh, how do I go back? I do I go back? No? Right. Ah, yes, that's how I go back. Okay. Uh, so, I say that, that's available today. If you want to browse to that website, it's an open source product, right? So you're, you're, you're more than welcome to have a look around it. Uh, and of course, we chose all the languages. Right, so that's basically, uh, I wasn't watching myself for time, but that's, uh, that's basically our presentation. Thank you. Sure. Well, maybe, like, what is it you want to do? Talk to us? I mean, I, I appreciate we may not have gone up high enough to, no. to click with you guys, right? There may be a, still a layer of misunderstanding or confusion, and we may have to push up our API. Like like yeah, sure. Well, let, let us know your specific use case, and, and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Because we're, we're eager from our side to complete this, this dialogue, right, and make it easy and comfortable as we possibly can, right? So we're, we're happy to do that. Yeah.
Hello. <laughs> Hi, Mike. Thank you very much Hello. for your presentation. Um, three things I'd like to ask you about. Um, in terms of your library, and I do get libraries, I used to be in the games industry a long time ago. Um, what is it you're trying to do with the library? What is it you're trying to solve where you think cryptography, for example, is missing? The other thing is, doing what I do now, I protect organizations like banks, and most of the time I have to interfere with cryptography. So in other words, employees or the business going out, I have to inspect, and their customers or third parties coming in, I have to inspect, okay? And lastly, um, ransomware. So cryptography can be misused. Oh yeah. Okay, so it's what, what would you like to achieve with your library? What do you think about oh. us in industry having to interfere with cryptography? And what do you think about the misuse of cryptography? Yeah, well, obviously cryptography isn't, it's just, it's just mathematics at the end of the day. It doesn't have a moral compass. It can be used for good or ill. Uh, people who encrypt things can be the good guys. It could be, you know, people who just want a private conversation living in some autocratic regime, or they could be the bad guys. They could be pedophiles, you know? So uh, uh, cryptography gets used by good guys, bad guys, for good and for bad. Overall, uh, I think we're better off than it, it does exist because uh, it's, the ult it's, the, it's the tool, ultimately, if you want security and privacy, no matter where you're coming from, at the bottom of that pie, you'll hit crypto, right? Crypto is the bedrock that gives us the promise that we can be private, we can be secure, right? If we get all the rest of it right, if we get all the connections right. Our library is an attempt, as I say, to, to connect from the bottom up because too often the, the, the stuff comes from the top down. People are shouting at us, not listening. They're, they're saying, we want, we want you to do this, we want you to do that, do this for me, do that for me. And we're kind of saying, hang on, wait a minute. It is more subtle, it is more difficult, but we need to have those conversations properly. So uh, the, our, our API, our APIs uh, consist basically, uh, you pass things into our routines via byte arrays. So we're not asking you to interact with elliptic curve points or, or mathematical structures like that. You communicate at our API level through simply strings of bytes, right, that you want something done with, right? So we're, we are making an effort to make the interface as smooth and easy to use as possible. There's still a greater need in terms of education, though. That I mean, we're, I'm not claiming that we're going to solve all the problems of the world with this. There's, there's, a, there's a bigger issue of education, of communication, of just the, having that dialogue. And that, those real-world crypto conferences, I, I would strongly recommend, is the place to go and the place to have it, where you can sit down with a, a world-leading cryptographer, and they'll talk to you mano a mano, and you can have a decent conversation, and you can tease out the issues, right? So these libraries are just part of hopefully what will be an ongoing attempt at education and dialogue. Um, so that's basically where we're coming from. Thank you. Yeah, we have, yeah, uh, Barreto, Barreto Lynn Scott, elliptic curves, yeah, yeah.